Uh, I'm going to skip the introduction and keep going because I, I have a tendency uh, ever since I started lecturing to talk in 90 minute increments and so we don't have 90 and so if I tell you about me and, and what I do, uh, we won't get through. So let me just get started and, and talk about student athletes. Are they students? Are they athletes here uh, on campus at Cal? Um, first, let me just say that I'm fortunate to be the one talking. Uh, the campus is full of, of faculty members who are very actively involved. Kelly McElhaney at, uh, in, in Haas, Gary Firestone, most of you have heard Bob Jacobs since he's the NCAA chair faculty, and Martha only gives tireless hours when she uh, gets out of her economics office to get out, and she's very active with women's basketball, women's crew, and very focused on the academic side of student athletes. And so I, I have the honor of talking to you, but in no way should you think that I have a monopoly on uh, uh, giving uh, to, to student athletes. Um, let me just give you a quick overview of how a faculty member's time might be spent with student athletes. How, how many parents of student athletes do we have in here? So we have, we have a lot. So uh, uh, as you'll remember is during your recruiting trip when, when your son or daughter is a senior in high school, we'll have a faculty member as part of the team. We're going to be part of, of your son or daughter's life throughout it. And so it typically, depending on the sport and depending on the individual, there was a variety of us that will sit down. Yesterday I was sitting down with a young lady uh, out of uh, Henderson, Nevada, the, uh, one of the best point guards in the country who's very academic driven, very academic focused, and, and hopefully will become a, a golden bear. But it starts in, 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 call it 2013. When you're freshmen, we, we team up. You know, I, I got a quarterback's coach to call me and say, you know, my quarterback doesn't think he has to go to school, so uh, he hasn't gone to class the first two weeks. So I say, hey, yeah, five, five o'clock, I'll see you in my office here at Haas, and what out? I'll see you at five. I said, well, what, what are we going to talk about? I said, just knock on the door. I'll be there at five. And uh, we had a good talk. And so we use a team approach to, to the students on, on, on campus, and it's nice to hear it from a variety of ways. And if this student's going to apply to Haas, it's good that we start building that relationship. When it's application time, uh, I'll sit and talk to the student. Uh, you know, applications are a hard thing to write. We spend so much of our educational career writing for a teacher versus about us, and, and uh, while athletes, uh, you'd think they could write about themselves pretty well because you have to have a lot of confidence, it's difficult to write. And so coaching and talking about it is important. Into the classroom, internships, studying abroad, how do I make it work, and then on into the business world and you know, still getting a call years later, uh, networking, life after Cal. And so the faculty are intimately involved uh, with, with the students uh, throughout the process. The, the one thing I'm, I must tell you is it, it can't happen if the person at the top doesn't want it to happen. And it, most of you, I saw a lot of parents here, you'll know the, 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 the president is not the chancellor or the athletic director, it's your coach. And, uh, you know, I was thinking about all the different coaches. We have so many Cal alums who are also coaches that understand the culture and the importance of, of education. And you're here at, from, uh, you know, our Olympic teams and our Olympic swimmers, Dave and, and Terry, unbelievable. Kirk uh, graduated from here in the water pole up in the right-hand corner. Peter Wright and, and Walter and golf, uh, both are Cal alums. And Jack, uh, of course, is a Cal alum. And you know, over here on the left-hand side, Lindsey Gottlieb. Imagine having your, your uh, daughter come play for a graduate from Brown and the assistant coach from Stanford. I, I think academics would, would be uh, important. We have a growing problem at Berkeley that has nothing to do with our standing as an academic institution, nothing to do with our administration, nothing to do with our clubs. It doesn't even concern Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton. But the problem extends across the campus and has ingrained itself in our culture. In an age of political correctness and breaking down stereotypes, there is one group of students who need to be a part of this conversation. They are the student athletes of Cal. I wanted to find out what some of these stereotypes are. So I asked some students, and here's what they said. Sometimes it's easy for the Berkeley stereotype to be um, they're less academically driven, perhaps, uh, maybe uh, 
maybe less intelligent or prepared in general. There are a lot of students in like science and and the humanities who are also doing like amazing world changing things and don't really get credit for it while the athletes are just like always in the spotlight. They're generally not as involved um, in actually doing going to school and a lot of people feel like they get a lot of concessions from professors. Being a student athlete at UC Berkeley is not an easy task. Luckily, Cal provides student athletes with numerous resources to help balance their rigorous academic as well as athletic schedules. I go to practice, classes, and then I'm usually studying in between my practice and classes throughout the day um, and going on campus, going to office hours, going to tutoring and things like that. Um, I majored in integrative biology and I specifically focused in the human health and sciences track. So in August, I'll be matriculating into Harvard School of Dental Medicine and I hope to pursue a specialty in either oral maxillofacial surgery and specifically specializing in cleft palate birth defects or orthodontics. I, I was amazed uh, and I'm gonna try and get through my words uh, quicker because uh, Tim, uh, who did that documentary, is here and I have a few other guests that are gonna help me take questions because I think you'd like to hear from a lot of different people different than me, but I was surprised about the stereotypes and the words that were said in the, uh, in the thing. I was surprised the young lady thinks that athletes get more notoriety. I guess she doesn't have the right uh, links of information coming into her iPhone. I, I get a, a, a beep every, every two minutes about some aspect of Cal, and uh, sports is not 90%. There are a lot more going on than, than that. Maybe her phone's not set up properly. but. Uh, you know, and I, I, from an educational standpoint, maybe we need to educate the student body. Uh, the students are in and out. A typical student athlete day is uh, up at 5.30 for a little breakfast in the weight room from 6 to 7.30, wander down to class with a snack, class 8 to 12, probably have a tutor or a TA office hour at 12 to 1, grab a bite to eat, I'm in film from 2 to 3.30, I'm taped, I'm on the field at 4, practice goes 4 to 6, I shower, hygiene hopefully. And then I do dinner, and then I'm in the study hall, 8 to 12, and repeat. And so student athletes are going to be moving through campus pretty fast, and many on scooters. Kind of the, the why you see so many scooters up by Memorial Stadium, it's almost impossible to keep a, a athletic load and an academic load, and maybe we need to do a better job educating uh, people. I'm going to approach today in two phases. One, I'm going to talk about what I would call student athletes who are going to go to work and then student athletes who are gonna to continue to be athletes, and, and I get to work with both. Uh, I'm gonna focus first on the athletes that are students who then go on in the business world. I'm gonna call out a few people. Let's take the young lady down on the far right-hand corner. She's a La Marinda young lady. She's a coxswain in our number one national championship. She worked at uh, Wells Fargo's FX trading desk last summer. She'll be back there again this year. Uh, if we come across all the way to do I have a thing? We come across all the way to the left-hand corner, CB, Richard Ellis, and San Diego leasing. Uh, we talk about the Cal family. Uh, um, Connor uh, 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 Fumiller is there and was instrumental in networking and helping uh, Camille get in there. Um, you know, these two guys didn't work, uh, didn't, actually all three up in the left-hand corner didn't do internships. She played for USA softball. She's probably one of the top three players in the country. The next two guys to the right played uh, uh, National Travel Olympic League uh, water polo. Come down in the middle uh, here, Katie Kelly had a hedge fund last summer, probably returned there. So a lot of our student athletes, we have over 800 of them, uh, go through Cal in a variety of majors from Haas to others and then end up in the business world and that's through academics as well as, as, as athletics. Let me just go through some what I call the obvious and why our student athletes make such great students in the classroom because I think it's often forgotten. And I'm going to use Rich's, uh, Dean Lyons' is for uh, strategic uh, rules. Let's start with confidence without attitude. Athletics produces young men and women that have confidence without athletics. There's very few NCAA athletes that go unbeaten. Right? There are some days when you look like a star. I mean, we can ask our quarterback how he looked at Washington and how he looked against Washington State, right? One included a somersault in the end zone. The other was a pretty sore body all the way home. Practices resulting in coaches focused every day. I don't know how many of you have a job where you're bob 
bosses on you every day. Hopefully not, you'll get a new job. But these young men and women have somebody on them every single day. That, that'll build confidence without attitude, right? And they understand, and almost like strategy in the business world, their games exploit their strengths, and they prepare for and try to exploit the other team's weakness, sounds like any competitive uh, industry in the United States. Uh, preparation results in success. If I'm not doing the reading before lecture, the lecture is not going to be very good. If I'm not doing the homework that's due on Friday, I'm not going to do well in the midterm. So it's very easy for us to work with student athletes in the classroom because everything they've learned on the field uh, comes over into the classroom. Let's take another one of uh, Haas's core principles. Uh, Lifelong learners, right? So there again, every, every day you're talking to the coach, you're looking at film, you're looking at how well you're doing. Practice results in uh, coaches helping us in our areas of improvement. They're students of the game. It converts to the classroom. And it's lessons, lesson after lesson, drill after drill. Work well doing derivatives in an economics class so we can get the slope under the curve. It's one redundant thing. And so our athletes, if they just uh, turn and, and put on a different tint of glasses, what they're doing on the field is the same in the classroom. What they're doing in the classroom is the same on the field. You want to talk about tenacious time managers. Uh, th those 800 are exceptional time managers. Beyond yourself, uh, you know, the time commitment is unbelievable uh, that, that uh, the 800 have to go through. And that's certainly beyond yourself. They're measured every day. Right, you're measured on the field with points and, and success, and you typically have a depth chart, and can the number two challenge the number one in the classroom? You're measured, right? And uh, out on the, on the field, on the court, whatever, uh, in the swimming pool, you're going to have to dust yourself off often. Those are great skills for the business world, uh, great skills for the classroom. And so uh, I think, and, and when I look around the campus and, and look at the young men and women we have, our athletes are great students. Uh, lastly, uh, questioning the status quo, can you push yourself beyond when you look at the national championships in rugby and swimming, uh, the women's basketball in the final four, uh, they know how to push themselves and they know what it takes to get there and, and practice is natural and understanding the overall plan, the plan of uh, getting education and preparing yourself for what's ahead in life. So. Uh, I think our, our, uh, our athletes who don't go on to be professional are exceptional students and add a lot to campus and bring a great uh, deal of skill base and, and uh, ability to teach to others. Let's talk a moment for what I've uh, done with uh, our professional athletes. It started back in 99 and 2000 with Namdi Asamoah. Uh, Namdi was a student of mine. He, he actually sat next to another student athlete. I still remember the seats they sat in, Michelle. While Michelle was a two-sport athlete, she was a field hockey player, women's basketball, we haven't had that in some time. Uh, funny thing, you haven't had a two-sport female athlete in some time, where does she go? McKinsey. Uh, after McKinsey and consultant, where does she go next? Uh, she's at Nike. Uh, where did she go after Portland? She's in Eastern Europe now for Nike running a division. And so uh, a student athlete and the skill base she got across two sports and uh, maintained a high GPA was phenomenal. But next to her was Namdi Asama. And he said, Steve, I'm going to miss class this week. Uh, but I won't do it again. I, I'm flying to Dallas. I have to interview with Jerry Jones, and, and I'm going to miss class. I'm going, do you, like, read the paper? You're going to miss class the following week when you go to Chicago. Then you've got to go to Miami. Then you've got to go to New England. You're going to miss a lot of class. We're going to be doing this class remote. And at that time, he said, you know, I don't know what I'm doing, Steve. Well, what's going to happen? What's this contract? Do I have to pick an agent? And, and so we sat down and decided to develop a class, uh, an independent study class that I've now... Uh, gone on to teach a lot of our professional athletes. And for those that don't remember, Namdi Asamoah is the first round pick of the Raiders. He's also today, he plays a, a bigger role. He's a husband for uh, Kira Washington. That might be the side that you remember. So I, uh, uh, through the years, starting with Namdi, um, developed a class. And I, I like to use the Olympic rings because I kind of worked a lot with Olympians. But I'd break it up into kind of five sectors, right? Uh, selecting advisors. Uh, in no way do I get involved in the advisors. We've got enough uh, in the, in the uh, newspaper about uh, basketball coaches around. I teach them how to make selections. And it might be an advisor, it might be an accountant, it might be a significant other, but how do you set criteria? What criteria is important? And then how do you diligence that? Do you call an acquaintance who loves the agent? 
or you call someone who fired the agent. What can you find out from the person that fired the agent that might be different from the person that had the agent? And that doesn't mean that you don't want the agent. Maybe they fired the agent because the agent followed up all the time and was texting and calling and making sure everything's okay. Well, that might work well for you. And so the selection of advisors is just, how do we make decisions in life? Let's think about it. Let's put a framework in place. We talk about budget, right? How many athletes uh, end up with uh, not a lot when they're done? Savings and retirement, social media and philanthropy. What I'd like to do is, is take a series of my students and walk you through what that, what that experience was like. And I'm going to start with the first one because uh, as parents and as teachers, there's nothing better than to hear your students speak the gospel. And so let me give you a clip that just really excited me. I have a few clips of this guy, and it, unfortunately, he was busy on Thursday night. And if I hadn't done the presentation, I might have had a few less clips so that we weren't focused. But uh, I did it uh, uh, long before Thursday night. But let's, let me show you a few clips. So if you had to say to like a young guy in Oakland who really wants to make it, he wants to be the new beast, and he's got the talent, well, what would you say to him? I ask him what his grades look like. Why is that? Because the reality is 1% will actually make it to the NFL. So if there's, if there's something that's going to happen, it's going to be your backup plan. Yeah. Have a backup plan is what you're exactly. saying. Exactly. I done played with guys who, on the a, on a first day in the NFL, have a career-ending injury. So, I mean, it ain't none of it promised. Mm. But I tell you, I had a backup plan until that dream became a reality. Mm. What was the backup plan? My degree. Mm. So, it's a pretty powerful... Uh... Uh, message that he had. Um, I remember introducing him to Chase Lyman. For those that don't remember, Chase Lyman was a great athlete, great student out of St. Francis High down on the peninsula, and first play in New Orleans. Done. Knee injury, never, never uh, played another down after that first play. Very successful uh, uh, real estate developer down on the peninsula today. He had a backup backup plan. you got to have a backup plan. And, and uh, grades are important. And uh, Marshawn, it, it's nice to, to see him uh, uh, out there doing it without me whispering in his ear. Um, I got to work with Missy uh, Franklin. And for those that have watched Missy uh, or know Missy, they have a three-person team. I work with Ryan Murphy. It's a one-person team. He's making a lot of decisions. Once in a while, he consults with Dad. For Missy, uh, David and DA are very, very involved in her life. Uh, before we did the class, we sat down and talked about what were the goals and how would Missy have a, 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 a voice at the table. And she ended up picking IMG. And uh, I asked, actually asked Missy and Ryan to come here. I wanted to get some gold in here. Uh, between the two of them, they have eight gold medals, but IMG has them both on the road uh, today, unfortunately, or fortunately for them to pay their rent. Missy's still enrolled at Cal. She's back. She can't swim, so she's a professional, but uh, she continues to train for the Olympics, lives on the north side, and uh, platonically, Ryan Murphy's her roommate and also here swimming, although Ryan has graduated, and he'll have a successful career after you know the next Olympics, but right now it's swimming. This, uh, I wanted to show this video because... We talked a lot, you know, picking the advisors and making sure the advisors get you in a spot that works for you. And for Missy, if you've ever watched her, the key was her brand and who she is. And this is an interesting commercial that's right down the middle of the plate. And, you know, it, and it was picking the right advisor so you end up having that advisor respect who you are and what you are and put you in a position to strengthen you as your brand. And this was really uh, something we talked about and this is something they executed. Has this robbed her of her childhood? I think it's really hard being a parent and knowing if you're making the right decisions or at least giving the right advice. Parents don't know it all. I'm so proud of her. I just want her to be happy. Please welcome U.S. Olympic gold medalist, Missy Franklin. Going into Rio, looking forward to that, what would constitute a success for you? So whenever I go into a meet, my coach and I, we sit down and we have a, a list of goals. 
tell us a little bit about what it's like to compete at the Olympics? It's the greatest privilege in the world. I mean, I think that's... What does having the support of your family, what does that really mean to you? My parents are my best friends in the whole entire world. The first order of so, business, of course, here in Berkeley this spring, replacing Jared Goff, one of this program's all-time greats. Sorry, I'm not as fast. Uh, my son was going to do it for me, but he said, Dad, I, there's no way I'll, uh, I'll have a clip that will go too long that everyone will think I, I'm not able to do it. So we'll just let Dad do it that way. So you can see Missy's brand. You can see what's out there. You can see that genuine uh, Missy Franklin attitude. And again, that came from understanding what you wanted, defining it, evaluating uh, what was in front of you, and the team, the three of them, picking uh, their sponsor and getting it in the right place. The next one I want to put up is... Uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, a lot of coaches try to teach and we try to teach in the classroom is blocking and tackling and, and writing it down. And the next young man uh, did an unbelievable job. I've, out of all the professional athletes I've had, there's no one that wrote and documented more than he did. And I just thought I would show you. One of the keys that I try to do is you're going to have a notebook that you're going to carry for life of, of every person you're meeting. I want you to scotch tape their card in. I want you to write notes. You're going to come back to that person someday. You may want to do a Minute Maid commercial. You may be in Atlanta and you want to call someone from Pepsi Cola or AT&T. And so uh, one of the things I, I teach, and I just wanted to show you a young man that really works hard. He's now in New York uh, playing for the Giants, but I've never seen someone document and write so much, and you'll see it in this clip that I had nothing to do with that Cal football produced. Great day to be a bear. Yes, sir. weeks where every season I always pick out a day where I'm just going to sit down, have some alone time for a couple hours and really think about what I want to accomplish this season. And for instance, this is my senior year, so I want to play this game for as long as I can. So my goal was to be the first quarterback taken in the NFL draft next year. So you know, what I try to teach in this section is what is your theme? What is your goal? How do you get there? How do you make your dreams reality? How do you block and tackle it? And, and how can a piece of paper and a, and a, and a pen help you? I, I was talking to Sarah before, and I, I just have a, I've been doing it for about 20 years, but I, I don't do speeches on, on cards and paper. I always take the mail, and I'm always writing at the kitchen table or at breakfast or you know, I'm out somewhere, and I just, I just can't do it. I want to talk a little bit about finances, and, and this was... This next clip, uh, Laura Ritchie. If you're not familiar with Laura Ritchie, uh, Laura is the uh, president of the WNBA. Let me show you the clip real quick, and then I'll tell you the story. Uh, this is one of our four uh, young ladies in the WNBA today. Asia, welcome to the WNBA. Congratulations. Thank the Indiana you. Fever, a great team. Give us your thoughts on when you heard your name called for the Fever. It was exciting. Uh, you know, we kind of knew who was going one through four or five. So after you hit, I figured it was somewhere between eight and 12 is what I heard. So that's when you get a little more excited. And just hearing Laurel say the name every time is really exciting. Really quick, kind of getting up on stage and coming down. And I think it's going to hit you more as you go home and get ready to, to go to training camp. Notre Dame, both a Chanwa and Lucas in double figures off the bench. What a drive by Clarendon. That was classy with the spin move there. She's quick off the first step. Lasia Clarendon in year three is getting more comfortable in the WNBA game. So, uh, Lasia Clarendon, she goes to, uh, you, I think you've heard of this at the NFL, Major League Baseball, the NBA, the WNBA. They have the player orientation. So, here they are, all, all the two rounds of the WNBA draftees, and, and Laurel and uh, CFO are running a presentation. And Lasia raises her hand and says, You know, the way the season works, are you going to match my 401k uh, at the end of uh, uh, 14 and going on to 15? And Laurel picked up. Laurel's a Dartmouth grad. She's named uh, one of the most successful uh, women leaders in America. Calls up Lindsey Gottlieb and says, can you, like, 
come educate every one of my draft picks that are sitting in this room with, with your, but she's just, you know, my goal was to give them enough tools, right? There are a lot of uh, programs or places in life where they just give you the fish. And my goal, the old Ackerman, is to teach you how to fish. Uh, I had an unbelievable year uh, two years ago. And uh, when you think about millions of dollars, um, I had some good, good students to talk about savings in retirement. I'll show you a couple of clips and tell you a couple more stories about the savings in retirement section. With the first pick in the 2016 NFL Draft, the Los Angeles Rams select Jared Goff, quarterback, California. With the third pick in the 2016 NBA Draft, the Boston Celtics select Jalen Brown from the University of California, Berkeley. I have a 17-year-old, Jalen Brown, sitting next to a 21-year-old, Jared Goff. It was fun having him both as students, first-round pick in the NFL, uh, um, third pick in the NBA. An interesting aside, Jalen Brown did not hire an agent, did not hire a professional. In the NBA, there's a CBA, a collective bargaining agreement that sets the compensation is fixed based on where you're picked. Why am I going to pay somebody 10% to tell me to sign the contract that already has a fixed amount on it that there's going to be no negotiation? The NBA contract's a standard contract. First kid to ever do that. Unbelievable young man. And so up here I have the asset allocation model. When I work with these students, I don't use a model that's any different than what I use in corporate finance elective. And when, you know, I wouldn't be here probably if it wasn't for Karen Krauss of the New York Times and also Bill Walton and Jalen Brown and Bill Walton's affinity for education uh, versus basketball and wanting to sit down with me and do this. But Karen wrote an article, a nice article about Jared and I in the, in the New York Times. And the day she was here was the day we were doing this. And Jared Brown, Jared Goff was putting up his asset allocation. Right, and just to bring you forward, that was 28 million in total, 18 signing bonus that's in the bank. The rest was guaranteed. And just, you know, I don't, I don't think it's confidential. Jared is a T-bill man. So he's getting a half a percent or a quarter guaranteed principal, but if any of you have $28 million, I encourage T-bills too. I don't need much growth uh, over time. And Jalen was on the opposite end. He says, and I have everyone just call me by my name, and they usually pick my last name. So Edder, if I don't invest in a venture capital fund, and by the way, we're now in the upper right quadrant, just past private equity funds or kind of your venture capital, uh, private equity says, I'm thinking I'm just going to back 10 or 12 friends. And if I allocate a uh, half million to each one and I'm an angel investor, I think that's more risky than if I have the diversification of a large fund, et cetera, et cetera. Here's a 17-year-old young man grabbing asset allocation and then proposing to me uh, something off the page. That's the kind of student athletes that Cal uh, uh, attracts. It's the kind of uh, kids that pick this institution. They want to use their intellect. And you all discovered during the draft that he had won like the 12-year-old or 13-year-old chess championship, but he decided that it wasn't enough time to do chess and basketball. And I don't know how much chess champions make, but he probably made a good economic decision. All right. Um, off the court, I'm really passionate about LGBT issues. I'm an activist, and I want to be a role model for the youth and for them to see that, that it's I okay, you can be out, and you can be successful. And so I'm always constantly pushing the boundaries and trying to be an activist and uh, let people know it's okay to be LGBT. What was the backup plan? My degree. Mm. Social welfare, basically what I'm doing right now with my, uh, with my foundation. What does that do? What about empowering? underprivileged youth in the inner city. Hmm. Our biggest thing is we got babies killing babies from where I'm from right now. We get through to that one kid who knows where he end up. Mm. We do a lot for them, uh, financial literacy. We give scholarships to them. 
Barsha, you, you were on the sidelines for a little bit there. What, what was going on? Was the back all right? Obviously, you got back in there. Yeah. How important was it to keep the ball on the ground and run out the clock, especially in the fourth quarter when you know this team is so good in the fourth quarter? Yeah. How does your back feel, Marshawn? Yeah. You got those heating pads in your cleats? I got a foundation dinner at the Edgewater on December 14th. On December 14th, um, to help benefit the inner city youth out in Oakland. We're trying to raise money to build a youth center. So, yeah. So, pardon me for a minute. I don't want to sound like I uh, am at the White House today, but I didn't get to see that clip uh, on the news that night. Uh, I only saw the first two or three yeahs, and I didn't read about it in the newspaper. Um, and just to go full circle, Josh Peters is one of his board members, uh, as is uh, Josh Johnson in that foundation, and that kind of tells some of the story from Thursday. But um, philanthropy is an important part. I think uh, the whole reason you're here is you love Cal. The whole reason I contribute my time for the last 22 years teaching is I love Cal. And we love access and quality. I like to call it the two words, access and quality. Cal is the best public institution in the world. There's a lot of benefits to going to a public institution versus a private one. And we're out there uh, in the lead tables with Pell Grants and access to others. And that's why you're here. You love the institution. It's why I'm here. And I don't want one of our uh, famous student athletes not leaving here without an understanding of philanthropy and their obligation to society. And uh, I hope they pick Cal but many of them pick other causes that are important. And I wanted to show you Lasia's cause. Uh, you know, she had a, a long five years here uh, struggling with that issue that she's uh, so intimately involved with today and, and through that learning experience while she was here and she came out, she was able now to go on and use her notoriety and her economic level to do something there. And Marshawn's very driven uh, to his, to his uh, causes. Uh, I want to bring some people up that have a lot more uh, knowledge than I have. I, I want to tell you one last Marshawn story uh, for Marshawn's sake, not for my sake. We were in uh, Australia, and uh, I was fortunate enough to make the trip with a lot of the student athletes I work with. And we had finished the dinner, and Marshawn gave the big Go Bears, we're going to beat Hawaii speech. And uh, uh, I'm sitting in the back eating with the, I, I don't like to, hobnob when I'm out there, so I'd done laundry all afternoon and with the equipment guys. I like to get in and do something, then sit around the hotel or go outside to see, and it was fun. Sitting back there with the laundry guys, and somebody comes up and says, Marshawn wanted to know if you had a couple minutes. So I went up. He was sitting at the head table. I sat down, and he said to me, Chief, I was in a meeting today, and I'm the king of the world. I'm going to be the entrepreneur of the world. I got this pop-up store, and I have this licensing agreement and the beast mode and my Skittles, and I got all my advisors, and they're telling me that I'm, I can say this right on Facebook, I'm the shit. I'm, I'm it, man. I'm, I'm really it. And then he leans over. He gets right down close. He says, I hear your words in my ear. I, I, hear, I hear the work that we did. And you're, you're the shit, it's not me. And, you know, uh, look, it, it's, uh, it's, it was uh, heartwarming for me, but what I want you to understand is education is powerful. And, and uh, educating uh, our athletes who go on to make great contributions in society outside of professional sports are a key additive to our campus, and those that do go on to play professional sports will do things after that. And, and there's a, a, a young man that continues to mature, continues to make a mistake here and there, and hopefully we'll learn from them. But, uh, you know, we've got some great, uh, great student athletes. And so uh, let's get a couple of people down. I want to take some questions. Tim, you want to come up? Tim uh, is uh, on our water polo team, uh, red-shirted this year, so he's not traveling with the team. And Abby is in compliance. Uh, Tim did the work and, uh, on the documentary. It's his documentary that is unbelievable. I encourage you to Google and go watch it. But I think he's lived and feels uh, some of what I call the discrimination on campus. Abby reviews every single application, admitted or not admitted, of student athletes and some that apply and don't apply. So you want to talk about at the heart 
uh, of every coach who call, call her at 1 or 2 a.m. to say, oh, did I tell you I got someone coming tomorrow at 7 a.m.? Can you look at their file and let's be prepared to decide uh, what kind of student they are for Cal. So uh, I'm here. Running in soon will be Haley Lucas. So unfortunately, Haley's on the soccer field. Haley is, uh, are Haley's parents in here? There they are. So uh, uh, unbelievable. One of, uh, you know, I think she, should, she will be up for the Haas Department Citation Award. She'll probably be up for the University Medal. Not only is she a star on the soccer field and a star in the classroom, she's a star in extracurricular activities out in front of the Pac-12 and the NCAA. As soon as her coach lets her out of practice, they have their last home game tomorrow, she will join us in the third chair. Um, we'll know how well they practice based on when she gets here. Um, <laughs> Questions? No questions? Uh, all the students you mentioned are in the school yearbook? The professional students or the one page of students on the, the mugshot page, everyone is in the Haas School of Business. On the professional athlete side, uh, none that were featured there were Haas School of Business uh, students. Ryan Murphy was a Haas School of Business student. Missy's not, Marchand's not. Um, but that doesn't preclude them for wanting to uh, invest their money, study philanthropy, what have you. But the mugshot page was full of it. We have 50 to 60 in Haas, so if you take that as a percent of total student athletes versus the whole population, we have there more, more student athletes. Going back to my PowerPoint slides, there's a reason. They have very strong skill base that they've learned throughout. I mean, if you're gonna play here, you probably had a very long club career in volleyball, soccer, basketball, so you have been at this a long time. Go ahead. Oh. This question is directed at Abby. Um, at, when you rec review the um, incoming athletes' applications, how do you do it differently than the normal review process? That's a great question. So uh, if anybody didn't hear, she asked how it, it, student athlete application reviews differ from normal students. Um, it's actually very similar. Um, in fact, the, the Chancellor did a task force on admissions, applications, um, in addition to academics with athletics. So when he did that, it actually created my position in addition to two others. One is in the Office of Undergraduate Admission. She's a senior director. And another is an analyst to make sure that we're doing things correctly. Um, the main review includes GPA and test score as it does. But Cal overall does what's called a holistic review. So they take a look at the background of students. What types of support did they have coming in? Um, were they first generation students, things like that? They also look at special talents, right? So in a way that you'd wanna look at uh, great actors or great scientists, things like that, somebody that could be doing an internship at NASA. They'll also look like that uh, for a kid who might have been the Gatorade Player of the Year or who, or who is competing in the Olympics and how they're also doing in the classroom, right? It's, it's a collaboration of all of those different components. So we ask, I, I do review um, and I assist with many student athletes applications on the front end, help them really get that voice across, right? Tell me your story. So, so many of them maybe five years ago would write, I played baseball, period, right? That doesn't tell us anything, right? Tell us about uh, your leadership, things that you did on the field. Were you a captain um, or were you the most valuable player? Things like that, but also what did you do outside of that? Some of our kids wrote this year about how they're really interested in photography and some of these other components. So they're very interesting people. Um, one of the basketball players this year wrote about how his coach attempted suicide and how he had to deal with that and how he had to be the captain of that team and really bring people together. So um, it's just trying to get those voices out there. Most of our kids actually make it through the regular process, the regular admissions readers, without any assistance or anything else uh, at all. Um, and the chancellor kind of oversees what that process will look like. Um, so everybody, no matter whether they're a student athlete or not, gets two admissions reads. So they get a, a look from two independent sources, two application readers, um, and then they get approval through that way. 96% um, of our kids made it through that process. The rest of them went to a specialized committee where they discussed them. Um, almost 100% of our kids had very strong and very similar uh, GPAs and test scores to the regular student body that was admitted. So know that these kids that are coming in are also very, very bright students. Um, none of them 
are going to necessarily suffer here. Everybody's at risk when they come into Cal. Cal's a very difficult institution. Um, and we do keep our GPAs and our, and our graduation rates very similar to the rest of the student body. So the, uh, I would interpret, I, I'm kind of pragmatic and very direct. When she says I'm helping the student athlete find their voice, the student athlete goes for four hours of practice after school. The typical 4.4 with the AP credits and the perfect SAT scores goes to an hour of club or plays the clarinet. Then they go to a three hour, how do you write an application for Stanford, Duke, Northwestern, Cal, all right, and we pay them to write it. The, the athlete missed that part because the athlete was on the soccer field in the, in the gym. There are only so many hours in the day that as tiger parents we can force our kids to go to these things. And so, yeah, one of the things that I work on a lot with Haas applications, we're done go. Uh, one of our student athletes who was here, he had to leave and go to practice, but uh, he worked the summer at Clorox and marketing. But f helping him find his voice is difficult, and, and there's not a lot, of, a lot of practice. Who else? Haley's joined us, so they must have been good at, uh, down in front, Tenny, all the way over on the other side. They must have been, uh, was practice good? You got out on time? Uh, hi, I'm actually a uh, current undergrad, uh, a freshman. I'm very excited for the uh, for athletic. I've been on, uh, been to all the games and just went to my first volleyball game last night. So I was just wondering, how can us as current students uh, help the student athlete to better integrate athletic and uh, uh, the amazing academic resource here on campus? Tim Haley, fire away. I think it's it's kind of little things in class. Um, when you have a big project or a group project, uh, kind of understanding that we're not going to be able to meet at times that are convenient for you. We have practice either really early in the morning or late, in, late at night. Um, so how you react to working with us like really helps us. Because if you understand that we have a sport to do and we have other obligations and you kind of are flexible with us, like. We'll give, you, we'll give you our time and we'll give you all the effort we can. And, um, but what happens sometimes is some students will be like, oh, well, he's an athlete, I'm just gonna do it all myself and then complain that, oh, he can't meet with me, he can't do this and can't do that. And so then it just makes us look bad when really we're trying our hardest to juggle sports, juggle our academics, and it's just the, har the cards were dealt that we have a, a bad schedule or something, so. Um, I don't know if this has been mentioned, but there's a student athlete advisory committee on campus um, that works just on this, is the integration of students and student athletes. And I think oftentimes student athletes get isolated to either up the hill at HBC or down at Haas. And so I think it's a joint effort of trying to get more involved in each other's activities. So like, thank you for coming to volleyball and like women's sports, because like a lot of people go to football, but not as many people go to field hockey games and things like that. So I think that's important from that end. But I think from our end as well, it's getting more involved in club activities and coming to things. Yesterday, we did a collaboration with our philanthropy committee in that group and then a campus organization for ending world hunger. And that was a really cool collaboration where we got to combine the student effort and the student athlete effort. So it's just those continued things of trying to integrate and go to each other's stuff and be supportive because we're all Cal students. And I think that's something we really need to rally behind. Hey, wait, wait, wait a second. Is there a women's soccer game tomorrow, your last home game? What time and where? Yes. Um, we're playing the University of Oregon tomorrow at 11. It's my senior day. So if anyone wants to come, um, it's our last uh, official home game. Hopefully we'll have another one in the tournament, but this is the last for sure home game. The, the, another thing I'll add, and, and I, I don't know if anyone watched the game, so Patrick Laird, uh, I think it's a medalist group, he, he had contact during the game and wasn't able to go to class Monday. Um, you can all do the math in football, how, how come that is. And so I sent a quick email out. Hey, who's in 107? Pick Patrick up. He's not going to be able to take notes today. He'll get cleared over the next couple days. And that's something, as you sit there and you remember, boy, he went off the field kind of walking strange. He's not going to be there on Monday. Take extra neat notes. Make a copy of them. Text and say, hey, can I, can I pick you up? Because I think sometimes he's not in a position to be texting and emailing anyone. And I was there to say, hey, tell me what classes you have. I'm going to get out ahead of this, this game because you got enough to worry about to get cleared and back. You'll see him today. He's cleared and back. But you can do that, too. Just like, I assume, are you the chair of that advisory? Yeah. Well, why is she the chair? Well, because she saw an issue, 
and she wanted to get involved. And your first step was great today, asking the question. Next is find her afterwards, and you be the student rep. There's no better way on your Haas application than to write, I got involved, but by seeing something <laughs> and going out and doing it. What else? We've got time for a couple more before they uh, run us out of here. I'll, I'll, I'll take it, Tandy. You want to go, or you want me? Oh, there's a mic there already. Steve. So I'm a parent of a just recently accepted Haas uh, student, very excited for her. Question, I completely agree with the value you see in these uh, student athletes as um, members of, your, of the Haas school. My question is, is there any tracking or anecdotal information to how these student athletes do postgraduate as far as um, the job opportunities, the graduate school admissions versus the non-student athletes? and just as you see these students as a um, complete person versus a professional student, do you think potentially those who want to go on to graduate school are also um, considered that in that picture as they apply towards graduate opportunities? Well, two things. One, what's really interesting is Susan and I were MBA colleagues together. We get a 100% response, where are you going, where are you going to work? And unfortunately, on the undergrad side, forget about student athletes, I don't know who has their phone, here's your phone, put it up there. They're a little busy with something else and they don't fill out our surveys. So it's very difficult to motivate the undergrads to give us data to follow it. I have lots of anecdotal information and our student athletes don't go home and live in the garage, they, they go out to work. There's a few firms, I interviewed at a couple where the GPA cutoff was 3.6 and so I didn't get to work there and they missed out and there might be some student athletes that have 3.5s or 3.4s who aren't gonna make that hurdle at that firm. Overall, our student athlete, or excuse me, our students from undergrad Haas, because remember we, we on purpose do a two year breadth liberal arts type business degree versus Michigan, Texas, uh, Wharton, it does a four. I mean, you got eight, eight M&A courses. I'd rather have you in world history and appreciation of music and so you can walk and talk and chew gum out in the business world versus being able to tell me uh, what the unlevered beta was on, on GE, right? So uh, our undergrad students end up going to Stanford and Harvard in your top five MBA programs because they've done so, so, so well. Uh, on a student athlete basis, if you go back to those four pages and PowerPoint slides, if you have an, an, an ability to articulate it, you do well. One of the young men I wanted to have up here is Michael Scharf. He was the Heisman Trophy winner in water polo, went to Stanford Graduate Business School, has an entrepreneurial firm, and uh, unfortunately is the best man at a wedding today with one of his water polo teammates and is off. But anecdotally, yeah, they're all over, and they do phenomenally, phenomenally well. And, and uh, we have a large, you know, 50-50 women and men, and so unbelievable uh, leaders coming out of our, our uh, female student athlete population that are doing very well in the business world. I'll give you an aside, I just, uh, I've got my notes down there, I f forgot her name. I just talked with the USA Today reporter. Um, she was up here, uh, uh, my office is next to, uh, uh, down on Channing next to the pavilion, so I walked over to watch women's basketball practice, which I like to do when I'm eating my sandwich. And USA Today, uh, uh, writer was there, and I, through my experience with Walton and, and Krauss at the Times, I've met some others, and I started chatting her up. She was here to write an article on moms in coaching in college. And we started talking, and if you thought, think about the business world. I was raised with a single parent mom who fought her way through the business world, and I work in it today. There's no other place that treats women as mothers, as well as college basketball. We had two coaches who took maternity leaves and had babies, and the babies are out courtside as they're practicing, and they're integrated in the team and in the life here. And so the way she's writing an article that'll appear in the next 30 days, watch for it. But how do sports, especially college sports, treat the coach, the woman, our lacrosse uh, head coach just had a baby, and how do we do it different, and what could we learn down Silicon Valley and some of the other places on how mothers should be treated in the workforce and how their careers can still prosper and go on? So I don't know if that I kind of took a tangent on, on your question, how are they doing later, but imagine that as an example. Any one of those young ladies that end up being the CEO at, at some startup or HP or GE says, oh, I remember Lindsay and I remember Kai and I remember how they were treated. What we need for more women to be able to continue their careers, this kind of child care and this kind of force. And so uh, 
the, the answer to your question, I think you, your child will do very, very well. Um, and the biggest thing is be active. You know, I, I, I didn't know Haley was, was uh, the chair, but I could guess it, right? Uh, I mean, just looking at uh, my experience with her in the classroom and, and you know, so if there's something that needs to be addressed, she's going to find an extra hour that she doesn't have to do it. Hi. Uh, what, Steve, what uh, you and have, have described up here is, is, is really tremendous, and it, but it all, it seems like um, it's, it's all a, a connected with Haas. And I was wondering if uh, some uh, athlete was majoring in like mathematics or something, do they have some uh, programs like you're talking about here? It's a good question and, and I went very quickly over the first slide and I'll just call the economist Martha Olney out and, and the amount of time. And, uh, again, I'm a lecturer, so I have a day job at Gray Rock Capital, and I come in and I lecture uh, twice a week for an hour and a half. Martha's a tenured faculty, she's a doctor in, in economics, and she, she, her job is to publish and do research, and so she's very driven to that. And like me, she spends a tremendous amount of time with student athletes, and the two teams she chooses, very women-focused, she's in, in crew, which has 60 young ladies on it, women's basketball that has 16. And she is as involved as I am. And I know there's a young lady that came to me and I didn't have the right answer. She's a Haas, Haas economics Spanish major with a 399 uh, student athlete of the year last year. And, and uh, um, uh, she had an economics question. Uh, and she went to Martha and she spends uh, hours, two, three hours a week with Martha as a mentor and as a guide. Does she do her PhD at Oxford and teach economics? Does she go to work in the business world? What's next? And so to answer your question, there are, I'll leave it to Tim and Haley, they're, they're all over campus. And Tim is not a Haas major, so he can talk to his major. And Haley takes classes all across campus. What, what do you guys see? Uh, I'm a uh, cognitive science and film major. Uh, I have teammates who are engineering majors. I have history majors, uh, poly-econ. They're all over the place. Uh, there might not be kind of a support system as Haas does such a good job of, um, with, but that's also because Haas is the only school that you apply to in your second year at Cal. However, the alumni connections you have on each of your teams is so powerful, and what we can like reach out to uh, in, each, in respect to each of our teams is an incredible network that really helps us. I think also the power of the kind of support network of Haas is that the students um, were able to seek out that those resources, and I think it's so well documented um, just because so many people have done it. So for me, um, when I heard Professor Etter um, could help kind of mentor me through this process, I really took advantage of that opportunity, and I've told people kind of about my experience, and that's why it's been so successful, I think, in the business school, because I've told a lot of people about it. And so I think in other majors, for my teammates, like the ones who have sought out those mentors have really found those resources in those departments and maybe we don't necessarily hear about them because there's not kind of this talk going on about it but i think it happens across all um, disciplines throughout campus i have a lot of um, teammates and past teammates who are going on to medical school and law school and uh, becoming doctors and whatnot so there are resources across i think it's just the individual seeking out those resources because there's so many across campus in every discipline Abby, do you want to tell you? could probably list off 40 in, at the top of your head because you're <laughs> much more involved breath-wise than I am. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was just going to say, two years ago or two and a half years ago when I took over this specific role, one of my, one of my roles was to start expanding our faculty uh, contacts. It started with 15 when I took it over. We have eight, over 85 now, which is really impressive, many of which want to join this faculty fellows program. So we're trying to tie in uh, different faculty members from all over campus with a team or two or three with each team. Uh, football is going to have over 10 just because of the, the number. Crew will have a couple as well. Um, and then each sport we're hoping to have at least two or three. So we're really trying to tie in different units. 
Additionally, actually this past week, the law school reached out to me um, and said, we have a group of law students and law faculty who really want to get involved. Can you please connect us with your student athletes who are poli-sci majors, things like that. Um, we're actually going to bring that to G back on Tuesday, um, that list of individuals who's in the law school who are very interested. So the breadth is huge. Um, only a percentage of our athletes are, are, or our student athletes, I should say, are in the Haas Business School. But uh, Josh Perneau was in physics, and he's going off to do interesting things with that, in addition to being a very strong Olympic swimmer. Um, and we have kids, again, from all, all ranges. As you saw, Marshawn was a social welfare major and is finding a way to be a part of that. But again, it's not all NBA and NFL athletes. Um, and, you know, the Alex Morgans of the world who are off doing professional athlete things. Only a percentage of them, maybe one or two percent of our athletes, will go on to be professionals in that realm. So the rest of them are going to take great pride in having that Cal degree across all spectrums. And, and hopefully the business school can put them in contact, but so will the law school and some of our other great institutions. That's great. Thank you. Any more? We've got a couple seconds before uh, Sarah tells me if we're all done. I'm a parent of a um, recruiting athlete this year at another UC, sorry. <laughs> but do you have any suggestions um, for a parent to ask the coach questions or the administration questions with regard to the recruitment process and making sure that the um, opportunities that you have and the resources that you have are at the next UC? Great, that's a great question. I'll defer to these two as well here in a minute um, because I'm sure they have a lot of things that maybe they would have wanted to be asked before coming here. Um, but I would start with asking about the resources, right? So what types of support do you have once you're here? Uh, at Cal, we have what's called the Athletic Study Center. So they'll each be assigned um, an ASC advisor who will help them map out what the four years will look like. They'll also have a major advisor who will help them once they choose that major. Some of them, like engineering students, will choose that upon arrival. Business school will choose that their sophomore year, and pretty much the rest of them will choose that their uh, major their junior year. Um, but they get supported that way. There's also learning specialists and tutors. But every school does it differently, so you'll want to find one that really matches their personality, right, the things that they offer. I would also ask about the networking, how they can utilize those throughout it, the internships, things like that. What the coach's style is, right? Each coach is going to be different. And as Steve talked about earlier, that's going to be their main person, I guess, their, their main uh, contact for four years, right? Your coach is going to be one of the main people that you see every single day. You want to know the team dynamic too, right? Do I fit in with this team, with this group, with this school? What is the, the school at a greater um, standing for. So I'll defer to these two about things that they may be asked or would have wanted to ask as well. Um, wow. Uh, definitely tutors. <laughs> I think that's one of the most important things. It was learning that I can, I can have a tutor who will be able to kind of, if I need help, go through the work with me, help me understand. I was, I was doing horrible in econ uh, last semester. And I was just, a lot of athletes have it in their heads, like, I have to do it myself, I have to do it myself, I have to do it myself. And we forget to ask for help a lot of times. Um, and so one of the greatest advice I got from my parents was, sign up for a tutor. You get it for free. Why are you not doing this? And so I started going, and uh, they were able to check my problem sets. Uh, grades started going up. Ended up with a grade that I wanted. Um, so definitely the academic resources needs to be a question of, what support systems you have there. And then also, kind of the parents getting on, asking your kid uh, to go to office hours, to go do the things that normal students have to do in order to get a good grade. Because uh, making those connections with your professors is one of the most uh, fulfilling things I've had at Cal. Uh, I might, I'm not an econ major, but my econ class, I went to office hours almost every week, and it was one of the most interesting classes. And, because these professors were so interesting and like were so involved with the, like so involved with the world like before they came to Cal. So as he passes it to Haley and she uh, pulls her thoughts together, I just want to say something. We have a bunch of tutors there down the Athletic Study Center. Do we have tutors because our athletes are not very smart or do we have tutors because they were not able to go to the group study period with their peers at Moffat and Doe because they were at practice at meal or at another athletic thing. And so I, I think we get a negative stigmatism 
that we, I, I mean, you end up in your tutor with six other student athletes down there in a room. And what we're missing when we think, oh, that's because they're not very smart. Well, that, you heard Abby, they're all, 98% of them are going to get in regardless if they're an athlete or not. It's because they don't have the time because they're on a field or in a pool or in a gymnasium. I just want to make sure that's clear because oftentimes we think tutors, so it's bad. No, all the other students are already meeting when you're at practice. Like today, Haley's at practice, there's probably a group meeting going on 9 to 12 somewhere. Go ahead, Haley. Um, to kind of go on your question, I think it's important to ask the coach or um, the advisor, like, what are the student or the athletes on the team that you're kind of being recruited for? What do they study? Um, what is the the academic kind of sphere look like for those kids on that team? Because sometimes at some schools, it's pretty concentrated in one area. Unfortunately, at some institutions, you can't take a specific major because of class times and things like that. So it's interesting to know, like, what do they study? And also find out who studies maybe something that your child wants to study and talk to that student athlete specifically because I think that they have a more honest and, um, I guess, like, immediate experience of what's going on right now than a coach will or than an advisor will. Like, they have the academic kind of, like, answers for you, but I think the student athlete kind of experience and how they go through, like, I think that'd be a good conversation to have um, with the student athlete specifically. I would also go um, back to the resources that Cal can provide it, above and beyond academics, right, and, and what your family needs. Um, so financial aid is a big one as well, whether it's athletic support or institutional support. So uh, if that's something that your family wants to think about as well, even if you have the funds, sometimes it's helpful to get that, that institutional aid as well. So those are great things to think about. Great. Well, I want to thank uh, Steve Etter, our main presenter as well. <laughs> Haley, Abby, Tim, thank you very much for being part of this program. Another round of applause for them.